Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and welcome back to Student of the Word. And today we are in the second half of Galatians chapter five. We're gonna talk about the fruit of the spirit, the works of the flesh, and what does it take to really please God? And what does it take to really win souls for Jesus Christ? We're not here to please ourselves. We're here to live for the pleasure of someone else, to lead them to Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome back to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Great to have you with us today. And we are in chapter five. We should complete chapter five today. I say should, because I never know if I'm going to or not, but I've got plans to. And so we'll finish chapter five and then we'll just have chapter six left in the book of Galatians. But oh, what an incredible study. What a, what a, what a great writing on freedom, love, worshiping God, helping people. And you're not the issue. And yet, if you go back and try to keep the law, Law, which again, the law is the things found in the Word of God, but also all the rules and regulations people try to add to it. If you go back to keeping those, you become self-centered. And listen, the Christian life is not about you. It's about you learning to love others. And so this is the essence of it. And my book on the book of Galatians is being offered. The announcer will tell you. On the previous program that we studied here in the book of Galatians in chapter five, we talked about laws, dietary things, and circumcision, all that. And I made a distinction between spiritual things and just natural things. Listen, watching your diet and exercise and all that, it might have some natural benefit to it, but nothing spiritual. It's when you start thinking you're being more pleasing to God because of the food you're eating. When the Bible tells us in Romans that the, the kingdom of God is not in food or drink. Now, listen, there's nations around the world right Right now, Christian nations that listen, they'll take anything they can find to eat. There's just not that much food available. There's nothing sanitary in the food they do. They might try to wash it and all that. But listen, I mean, I've been to places where cats and dogs were hanging off of ropes and people were buying them at the market for food that night. I mean, and they said, you don't ever let your dog run out the door because you won't see him again. Somebody's going to be eating him. And this is what they live off of. So again, we find that, you know, we in the United States, we have great food in Europe, places like that, you know, first world nations and all that. But man, you start getting into third world nations and they just, they'll just take anything. And they don't even understand it when we try to talk about food and all the books we have on how you eat and all that. When again, it comes back to it. And so I have another book and say, it's called The Grace of Healing. And I have a chapter in there on what I'm talking about here from the book of, of Galatians about the kingdom of God is not in food or in drink. So when you look up this book, then you might also try to find on there a book called The Grace of Healing. And it'll talk about the grace of God in your daily walk and the grace of God when it comes to eating and drinking and the things that you do in life. It'll talk about that and just really come back to the importance of the word of God and being led by the Holy Spirit too. Verse 18 here in chapter five of Galatians says, if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The thing that I pointed out in the previous lesson was this, is that by following the law, you become self-centered. By following grace and the Holy Spirit's leading in your life and the word of God, you become others minded. And that's why God saved you to quit thinking about yourself and become aware of what's going on around you. Romans chapter eight, verses two through six, walking in the spirit, and being led by the Spirit is not something mystical. No, it's something available and, and to all of us, not just a select few. It's available to all believers and anyone can fulfill what God has for us, but it comes from walking His way, not our way. And again, not being caught up in all the things, I could be doing this, I should be doing this. You lose the fact that people out there need Jesus and what saved you was grace of God and also simple faith in God's promises. That's what causes you to grow also. Verse 19 here of chapter five says this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Notice this, that flesh produces works. God doesn't produce your works in you. The word can produce works, but they're a different type of works. They're works to please God and help people get saved. But the works that you do from your flesh are where you try to work on yourself. And the more you work on these things, the more they stand up and want to grab hold of you because you're not being controlled by the word of God. You're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. You're not being controlled by grace. You're now being controlled by your own will. Your will couldn't save you. What do you think is going to make you 
spiritual, the same thing that got you saved, and that is the grace of God. Verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, which means, for example, this is not a full list of them. This is just a list of certain ones. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness are the first four mentioned here in this verse of Scripture, and they are all sexual sins. Adultery, having sex with somebody you're not married to. They might be married to someone else, or you might be married, but this is sex outside of your own uh, life of being married. Fornication, this is between people that are not married. Uncleanness, this gets into all types of perversion that is inside of sex. And lascivious simply means you can't quit. It's like once it gets in you, you have a lust for more. And the more you have, the more you want. The more you want, the more you have. You just keep getting more and more until finally you're so far off track. These are the offspring, the works of the flesh. The first four, again, like I said, are sexual sins, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and this includes homosexuality, lesbianism, bestiality, and finally lasciviousness, where you're totally controlled by your sexual desires. Verse 20 goes on to say, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, idolatry and witchcraft have to do with worshiping. Listen, you can't turn against God and start following yourself and think, oh, I don't believe in a God. There's always a God. Somebody always has something that is the highest in their life and they put on a pedestal. And so it doesn't have to be a carved image, but anything that has preeminence over God and money, especially the love of money is the root of all evil. It might be your personality, might be someone else's personality, might be some hero that's out there. It goes on to say there in witchcraft is mentioned, one who administers drugs. In fact, the Greek word for witchcraft is pharmakeia. And it's again, it's a word word having to do with medicines. And so pharmakeia here is talking about drugs, one who administers drugs for sinful reasons, for sorceries. Hatred is mentioned here, personal hostilities towards someone else or just a lot of people. A mental sin which justifies or does not justify. This is hatred. So it's all right in the Christian life to hate the sin while loving and helping the sinning one. That's Galatians chapter 6. But again, where you start hating people around you, you start looking at them and making judgments about them. Listen, it's all right, again, like I said, to hate what they're doing, but you're after the help of them. And in fact, that's why you want to get them saved, to change the very nature on the inside of them. Variance. Variance means you're at strife with people. Someone dislikes you, so you dislike them. Emulations are mentioned. This is jealousy or envy. Spiritual king of the mountain. You think you have the top and everything and you can judge other people. Wrath, emotional outburst, explosions of anger. One minute you are quiet and the next minute you just have an explosion. One thing happened and you lose control of yourself. That's wrath. Strife. This is group antagonisms or disputes. This group is angry at this group. The Hatfields and McCoys basically inside church, inside your own life, inside your own family. Seditions. This is group divisions and separations from others over points rather than people. Movie ratings, whether we should drink wine or not, and all the things that the Bible really doesn't say a whole lot about. And we take and we amplify and and make other people feel guilty because we come across as such a spiritual expert. Well, the Holy Spirit told me, well, if it's not found in the Word of God, then it probably wasn't the Holy Spirit telling you unless he's clarified something within the Word of God. Heresies. This means to hold an opinion, which is an opposition to the Word of God. And a lot of Christians today are walking around in their own heresies. Verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you're acting like the sinner, the one who's not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Envyings, envyings is jealousy without a particular target. Everyone's getting a better break than me. It's a grudge toward everybody. Murder. This is taking an innocent life. Now there's mental murder, which happens before the actual physical murder, and you're to stop it there. And so again, murder, taking an innocent life, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. Drunkenness. This is drinking to excess. 
And so, again, the Bible's always been against drunkenness, revelings, carousings, brawls. This is what this is talking about, which is usually a result of drunkenness and people getting into fights. And such like, he finishes with this. In other words, there's a whole lot more I could get into. And this is just a few. I could go on and on. And such like means things like this. So he says here, I have told you, I have forewarned you before, is I have told you in time past that those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice there's a difference between you and they, you and them. He says, I have forewarned you and I have told you that they which practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He's simply saying that when the believer is caught up in the works of the flesh, he looks and acts just like the other type of person, the unbeliever. In fact, you can't tell by looking the difference between a carnal Christian and an unbeliever. And they look alike. In fact, he says, when you're carnal, he said, you act like the unbeliever. And so you can't just tell by looking, but you are different than them. That's why a spiritual believer is what God is looking for. Not one controlled by his flesh. That looks like the world. He imitates the world, but one who follows the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and you completely contradict the look of the world. You stand out among everybody else because why? You're filled with joy. You're filled with peace. In every situation that comes up, you make the right decisions, and people watch you. It doesn't just occur over a few weeks. It keeps going on and on and on because anybody knows you can just grit your teeth and do things right for a while, but then you lose it. The world does that, but so does the imitator of the world the carnal Christian. So what does he mean in these verses of scriptures? He says, who do, who do such things means that they practice such things. The world practices sin. It's a way of life. The carnal Christian practices sin. Although he's a Christian, you can't tell because he just imitates the world, hangs around the world, wants to be with the world all the time. And simply what the verse is saying is, you, if you are different, act different, but you're not going to act different by rules and regulations. You're going to act different by following the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And the more the Word of God grows in you, and the closer fellowship you have with the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to imitate Jesus Christ himself. And that is the purpose of the Christian life. It doesn't come by following the flesh. It comes by following the Word of God and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so the same words and thoughts are taught in 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And there he brings it out in those verses of Scripture. Verse 22 goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is the recreated Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. And so this all comes back to what happens when you follow the Lord. And these things are things you do without actually trying. They just come to you naturally. I'll see you right after the break. The Apostle Paul knew that works can't bring salvation. The Galatian churches, after believing the gospel of grace in Christ, were misled into Jewish law. Paul wrote to them, confronting their foolishness. His letter declared salvation by faith alone not based on effort or observance, but solely upon the grace of God. In this New Testament commentary on Galatians, Bob Yandian defines legalism, its effects on the Galatians, and its impact on today's church. Seeing how legalism infected the Galatian churches, we can learn to overcome this subtle attack on believers today. To order this New Testament commentary on Galatians, visit our website at bobyandian.com. How much faith do I need to be healed? In The Grace of Healing, Bob Yandian answers this question and reveals the missing ingredient to the healing you've been praying for, grace. Throughout church history, the doctrines of grace and faith have been taken to separate extremes as they relate to healing. The result is that many believers struggle to receive healing from God. Those on the side of grace deny the need for faith, believing that God only heals a select few. For those who only see a need for faith, the pursuit of healing becomes a legalistic struggle to change God's mind. Pastor Bob takes a different approach with practical biblical teaching that balances both elements of grace and faith. You'll find the healing you've been waiting for when you find the missing ingredient of grace. To order The Grace of Healing, visit bobyandian.com. 
Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Keep your thoughts right there on Galatians 5.22. And I just want to talk very quickly in the second half of this broadcast to those who have been with me for some time, those who have followed me for a long time. You can tell I love the Word of God. I just love the Word of God. In fact, I just love to take it and make it so simple, but make it so applicable to your daily life. This is the call that's on my life. It's been there from the time that God called me into the ministry. And I was in, in Oklahoma State University. The Lord spoke to me in my junior year and said, because I was just fretting. I was fretting because I didn't know what I was supposed to do. If I, if you'd ask me, what do you want to do, Bob? I'd say, I just like to study the Bible. You know, do I really have to study all these other things they're trying to teach me? Because I know I'm not going to use them, but I don't know why I just love to work the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me just before the end of my junior year and said, you're going to become a teacher in the body of Christ. Oh gosh, it's like all this stuff hit me. He didn't say you'd pastor, although I did. He didn't say you'd have a television program, of which I do. But he just simply told me, I'm going to be a teacher in the body of Christ. And so I put all my effort into it that next year and went to Bible school. And from that time on, I have never looked back. I so enjoy what I do. I love what I do. And I believe this is the way it should be. If you're an evangelist or, or you're a Christian, that you know, and, and, and you've got a job somewhere, but just being a Christian, following God should be the most fun in your life, using it in your job, using it in relationship with other people is it. But you see, I couldn't do it on my own. I depend on books that were out there, on, on reel-to-reel -reel tapes. I mean, I had tons of those things of ministries and then cassette tapes came out and I had on cassette tapes and, you know, later on as things have grown, you know, now it's all downloadable and things like that, amazing things today. But all I can say is I just keep following the Word of God. And so I needed somebody to look to. And now many of you are looking to me because through the years, God has elevated me. The Holy Spirit's elevated me. I didn't do it in my own strength. I just did it because I love it. And God elevated me. And so God has put me in a position. I so appreciate people that just write to me and say the same things. I used to write to certain pastors who were still alive alive, ministers still alive, books that were written. And I, I, and if I ever saw the person in a meeting somewhere, I'd thank them for the book and specifically mention what ministered because that does good to you because I'm not doing this to build me up. I'm doing it because when God gives it to me, I'd love the look and the expression and the attitude in people of what I've taught has changed their life. And some of you are so sold on that, you've actually become partners with me. I mean, it's like I've reached out my hand and you took my hand. We became partners. Partners Partnership doesn't start when our hands meet. It doesn't come with the exchange of prayers. It doesn't come with the exchange of finances. It starts in the heart. You join me in your heart one day and said, I like this guy. I like the way he preaches. I like other guys, but not like I like this because why I speak to the gift that inside it's inside of you. And many of you who are called to teach the word of God, doesn't have to be at your pastor. Could be you have a small class. It could be that you have a home group. No matter what it is, you love this because, and even if you didn't have a place to teach it, like me, I would put notes together, sermons together and had no place to teach them. That's how much I wanted to minister the Word of God. And so I'm simply saying the gift in me speaks to the gift in you and the gift in you speaks to the gift in me. We become joined together in spirit first. Then you became a partner with me. More than just watching this broadcast, you say, I want this thing to expand. And it is expanding. It is expanding rapidly. And all I'm saying to you is, I mean, the numbers of mail we get of people say, I found your broadcast, changed my life completely. That's the people again, I like to hear that from. But then there's also those that come back later and say, you know what? You changed my life. I mean, the things you teach are stuff that I've wondered about and suddenly you made it so simple, couldn't miss it. I want to join you as a partner and you do. And so you can go to my website, bobyandian.com and find a place there how you can become a partner with me and I'd love to have you.
and to know that you're standing with me in prayer and working together with me in finances to help us accomplish these things because I can believe Jesus is coming soon and soon doesn't mean tomorrow. It could soon could be a few years from now, but all I can say is soon. On God's timetable, it's very soon. And I believe that's coming so soon, but we need to do the number one thing we're called to, win souls and make disciples out of them. I love to win souls, but I really rejoice in making disciples out of them because that comes from the teaching of the Word of God. Go to bobyandian.com. And again, I thank you in advance. Those many of you known for some time, you're going to be a, a partner with me. You just haven't acted on it. Act on it. I can use you. Again, I thank God for you. Verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5 is contrasting the fruit of the Spirit to the verse before it, and that is the works of the flesh. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the recreated Spirit. And he now brings out nine of them, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, temperance. All these things that are brought out in this verse of Scripture are simply things that come from following the Lord. These things are in you in the beginning, but they become manifested and they become strengthened by following the Holy Spirit, by following following the Word of God. And the way they become strengthened is they begin to work in your life. You work them, they work you, and they become stronger. But you don't come back and brag on them or brag on yourself because every one of these things is is to help you minister to someone else. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and that's the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the recreated Spirit and also the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. These, again, are divine points that God has given to us. Verse 23, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all these things that are given to us. Let's talk about them individually. First of all is the word love. There's not, this isn't the general word for love. This is agape. This is divine love produced from a mature spirit. It comes from God. It goes back toward God and then toward other believers and even unbelievers. This is how we are to see the world. For God so agape loved the world. We also have that love inside of us and God told us to love the world, not the things of the world, not the things that they do, not the attitudes they have. We are to love the people of the world. The world is made up of basically two things in the Word of God, the things that happen in the world under demonic control, but also the people that are there. We're to hate the world system, but love the people of the world. And we're told to do this. So love is divine love, again, produced from a mature spirit toward God, and then also unbelievers and the unbelievers of the world. Number two is joy. This is abiding inward happiness. This is not something which momentarily comes. No, this is abiding happiness, even through the most eternal and external grief that comes around us. Some things we go through think, is this ever going to end? But the point of it is, I still have joy. I still wake up every day knowing today could be the day that God turns this situation around. And on top of that, I plan on winning somebody to Jesus today. So joy, that inward abiding happiness, even through external grief and mourning, it's a contrast to the world's happiness, which is momentary and based on circumstances. Number three is peace. Peace is inward stability when everything around you is falling apart. This is the type of peace God has given to us. Long suffering is patience. Just another word for patience. Then in other words, I have patience today, which takes me into tomorrow. And if this problem doesn't turn around, if these people still hate me a year from now, I'm still going to be walking in patience. And I, my wife and I and our church went through a three-year lawsuit, and that patience lasted through the entire thing. It had to be f- stoked once in a while like a fire that I'd get up and I'd read verses. My wife put verses of scripture for me and I'd read them in the morning and walk through them. And my prayer was, Lord, I would love for this to be handled today. But I prayed that prayer for three years and finally it was happen. It did happen. And of course, God brought us through. Verse 23, gentleness. This is kindness toward others. Goodness, treating others in grace as Christ treats you. How do I treat this person? How does Jesus treat me? That's how I ought to treat them. Goodness is that. Faith is actually the word for faithfulness and dependability. We have faith, but broadcasting that in our life is faithfulness. We make a promise, we keep it. We become dependable. This is the faithfulness God wants us to have. Meekness. 
meekness here simply means to remain teachable. A teachable person is meek. The meek shall inherit the earth. So a meek person constantly is open to being teachable. It doesn't mean you're always right or always wrong. It just simply means you're always teachable. And if you are teachable, then what's wrong in your life, you can learn how to do it right. So the next one is temperance. Temperance is self-controlled in the area of good things of life, the bona fide natural activities. Is it all right to go to a movie? Yes, but have temperance in it. Know where to draw the line. Again, I, I've taught before this. I'm not against uh, drinking wine. I think that's in the Word of God. But again, a little bit of wine for your stomach's sake, a little bit of wine God was looking at. And so just a little bit. Also, around people that don't believe in it, you cut back in that area, won't do that in front of people that don't believe in it. That's fine. But again, self-control in the area of bona fide natural activity. This is temperance. Eating is fine, but overeating, especially in front of other people, God says, don't do this because why? You have self-control. This is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. When these are operating in you, the law cannot touch you. Verse 24, and those who are Christ's have, past tense, crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. This is the passions. What's this verse saying? When you became a Christian, what was crucified in you was the flesh. The flesh that kept you from being saved now has taken a back seat. But the flesh that wants to also control you later and bring you into things that aren't right with the Word of God, you crucify that also. And so that's why we have here that the Bible says here in this verse of Scripture, if you are really Christ, you've given your life to Him, then you have crucified with the flesh the affections and the lust of it. That's the passions. God is simply saying here, once you're born again, I mean, you've crucified the flesh, but you know what? There's going to come times in your life where the flesh is going to rise up like the Judaizers have with the Galatians. They're going to rise up and you just tell them to get back down. And you put them under your feet and keep them under your feet. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 11 says the same thing. And there he doesn't say that you've crucified the flesh. He says, just reckon it dead. You know what reckon means? Act like it. You know, I mean, we use it in English. Oh, I reckon so. You know what reckon means? I count it as done. I mean, I reckon so means I've looked at it and this is what I consider it to be. Romans chapter 6 again, verses 6 through 11 says, I have reckoned the flesh to be dead. In other words, it's not dead. I just count it as if it is done. Flesh, you're rising up against me, but you're dead. You know why you're dead? Because you're part of my natural body. One day I'm going to die or God's going to come and ransom me and rescue me and rapture me out of this world. And as soon as my body is gone, you're gone. So you're only around for a while, but in the little bit of time you're around until I die, I am going to count you as dead. I'm going to look forward to the day you're dead and count you as that now. You're not dead, you know, in the future. I see you as dead now because that's where you're heading to. It's like a person that is isn't saved, they are as good as has one foot in hell. They're not there yet, but they're as good as being there. They can change that by coming and accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now we see they have one foot in heaven. So we start talking about heaven. I'm not there yet, but I reckon myself to be there. This is what a Christian needs to do toward the flesh that wants to take you off track. And verse 25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let's walk in the Spirit. If you are born again, then start to walk like it and verse 26, the end of the chapter, let us not be desirous of empty glory, vain glory, provoking one another and ending one another. Let's get away from this constant thing of trying to lift up ourselves by putting down other people. I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.